But right now, well, I hate saying, I hate saying I told you so, but part of the construction of the platform was a belief that many of our mainstream or legacy, as I call them, media enterprises, were not exactly playing with a straight bat, that many of their editorial takes or their staff were practising a form of self-censorship, sometimes funded by the government, which did not give you the truth or an impartial and unbiased uh, take on events here and overseas. And, well, I am going to say I told you so, because news out now, or breaking over the past, uh, oh, since last week, last Friday, that uh, one particular employee at Radio New Zealand has been stood down for altering Reuters news copy in relation to stories from the Ukraine to give a pro-Russian uh, slant. And as the story evolves... We also now hear that certain stories involving uh, the conflict in the Gaza Strip have also been altered to give a pro-Palestinian or pro-Gaza and anti-Israel uh, take, and also rumours and suggestions that transgender issues from overseas or copy on that is being changed and reported. Of course, Ben Esper and myself exposed a story about a police statement in regarding the post downstream from the Posey Parker events, which was a complete misrepresentation of what the police had said. Radio New Zealand altered the headline and some of the copy on that story, but never issued a correction, an official correction or clarification. And I guess why this is big news in the news or the media industry is that Radio New Zealand has long been seen as the bedrock of slightly boring impartiality. In New Zealand media, it is huge, it has been dominant, many people listen to it, and it is 100% commercial free and government funded. So what is going on? Should we be concerned? And what does it mean for the media in general? Well, we're joined now by an old boss of mine at TV3 uh, and founder of a new media company, so hat tip to him, uh, Mark Jennings, uh, who is with newsroom.co and newsroom, they're all right. They've got some funny writers like Mark Calder. Uh, and they take the government's coin or they took the government's coin, I think, from the Public Interest Journalism Fund and they sell their editorial content to some of their sponsors like the universities, but they're pretty good. And I respect Mark Jennings as a newsman, so a good person to comment on this. Mark, uh, lovely to see you. Uh, welcome to the platform. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, good morning, Sean. Um, it's, it's good to talk to you about a, a topic like this. Yeah. it. Look, firstly, how big a deal is it? Uh, I'm always a bit um, reluctant to do much navel-gazing as a journalist, and journalists like nothing more to talk earnestly about their industry. Um, but it does seem to me this is quite... In the, in the year 2023, when we have all this talk about disinformation, this is quite an interesting issue and quite important. Uh, look, I think it is both big and small. I know that's a contradictory answer, um, but it's big because it could have a big public impact. And as you know, um, legacy media, as, as you like to call it, has been losing trust. Um, and this is another blow for that. All the told you so people like you um, will be jumping on this. Um, well, you're already jumping on it. Uh, and, and saying, you know, we can't trust the media. Well, I'm just saying in this instance, there is clearly something going on here, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, RNZ clearly. says there is. They're launching an inquiry, for goodness sake. Yeah, yeah. No, there's clearly something going on. But I think it's one person, although the further investigation will show whether the stories that have been uh, now pro-China, um, pro-Palestine um, and anti-Israel... Um, and uh, I don't know so much about the um, anti-women trans one, but um, if they are not the same person, um, then there is a, a, a really big issue. But if they are the same person, we've got a case of one rogue operator. Now, the real story, of course, is how did this go on? How was it allowed to happen for five years or so? That's obviously a, a real problem but it does come down potentially to one rogue operator and you know um but a management we, system that failed to pick up that rogue operator yes. mark yeah, yeah sure sure but every sector has it doesn't it we have rogue cops we have rogue doctors we have rogue um accountants 
and occasionally we have a rogue journalist. But really, it's very small in number compared to the yeah. millions of stories that are that are written. Yeah. Do you guys, the other thing about RNZ, a lot of its content gets shared through other, and I'll use the term woke media organisations because that's the way I roll. A lot of its copy gets shared elsewhere. Do you publish some Radio New Zealand stuff? Do you have an arrangement with them? Yes, we do. And we do publish the um, the occasional breaking news story mm. um, because we don't particularly cover breaking yep. news ourselves. I know the feeling. Of a so, yeah. Um, so we have. But, of course, um, our own uh, sub-editors and editors look at those stories before they're published. Um, and we don't. We've never had a problem uh, with Did one. you correct? I'm not sure you did. I can remember, look at the time, that story about police call on Rainbow, Rainbow Community to report, um, you know, nasty stuff after the Posey Parker thing. We exposed that story and headline as being misleading from Radio New Zealand. They corrected. I don't think you guys did. I don't think stuff did. So your, your system, I hate to say it, just as an example there, isn't entirely perfect. But my question is... If you are republishing Radio New Zealand, I mean, are you going to review that, given that there are now these questions over uh, over the way they process their information? I think that's a fair, that is a fair question, and I think this is a wake-up call for the media. I think part of the issue here was that um, when the, these stories came out, They've still got Reuters or BBC at the bottom mm. of them. Yep. And there's an assumption that, oh, well, they've been through five pairs of hands. These are very sophisticated organisations. That'll be fine. And, you know, you don't look at it as hard as, mm. as you would if it didn't have Reuters or BBC at the bottom. So I, I think that is a fair point, and I think people will now. Partners, uh, content sharing partnerships with Radio New Zealand will be under a lot more scrutiny. Yeah. Well, how does that work? Do they get your stuff too and you get their stuff? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so I think it's something like they could pick up to two stories of ours a week and, and run them. Yeah. Um, they probably don't run that many, but it might be, you know, one or two a month. Yeah. The other problem we've got here, it sounds to me, and we haven't managed to track the guy down yet, though he has been named, this guy Mike Hall. Uh, that's Ben's job for today. Um, <laughs> look, he clearly had an agenda, and, and it sounds to me that he was almost crowing about being able to get away with it for five years. So you've got a rogue in, in the organisation. But I'd also observe that having journalists with particular penchants or, or attitudes isn't wrong as long as they clearly identify them. And I'd use the guy I jokingly spoke about, Mark Dalda. I know where Mark comes from on the issues he writes about. Now, I might extract the Michael about out of him, but he's allowed to do it because he wears his heart, his editorial heart, on his sleeve, right? Um, the question is, how many other people with secret agendas are in various news organisations around the country making tweaks here and there, and have we lost something if that is in any way acceptable? Because it seems to me, and you're old school, Mark, I hate to say it, um, I would consider myself old school, though maybe gone off the rails a little bit. Uh, this idea of impartiality and not pushing your own agenda does not seem to me to be as important as it used to be back in our day, if I can use that hackneyed phrase. Yep. No, um I think that is a, a, a good observation and I probably do agree with it. And I think it's a generational thing as well. Um, and I think it also probably is due in some way to the, the way the education system has changed and the way uh, journalism schools operate too. Um, but we notice younger journalists definitely are more opinionated or more interested in expressing those opinions than, say, mine or your generation uh, were, Sean, because that was beaten out of us. Um, well, not literally. Well, well kind well, of professionally <laughs> and a figurative well, team, yeah. yeah. Well, in some newsrooms, you know, yeah. you've, got a, uh, you've got a verbal assault. Yeah, um, or, a, or a, an well, audio yeah. cart in the back of the head, biffed down yeah. the newsroom, Chris Collins. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. 
so I, I, you know, I think it was very much stressed that balance um, was absolute key and that you did do two sides to every story. Or you, or but as many sides as you could find. You tried to be fair. Yes. Yeah, and you, yes, didn't, no, but the total, you didn't go in with a preconception necessarily about who the goody or baddie was, but we look at a story like a Apodike, it's pretty clear who the baddies uh, might yeah. be Might be there. Um, as I said, Mark, can I think I, this can thing... I say, though, what? Can I just say, though, that one of the issues here, I think, has been that Michael Hall has been working from home, I think, in Whangarei, and um, most of this, as I understand it, happened on the late shift and weekends when RNZ's staffing was very low or or perhaps he was the only person there. So this was being, if you like, slipped through at kind of opportune times. Um, now, I'm not excusing it, but I'm just saying, you know, it's interesting if that is the case. Yeah. We also don't know yet if whether or not the rewriting of this coverage around things in Gaza and Middle East uh, issues whether or yes. not that was Hall as well or someone else, right? Yes. Well, I think, as I said before, if it's someone else, there's big trouble. Um, if it's Hall, then he seems to have a, you know, a penchant for, I don't know, um, uh, thinking that, you know, uh, one side is disadvantaged and sort of trying to add something to that. But some of the stuff clearly was just false. So there's one thing about trying to maybe add balance to a story if you think the Russian side of the story is not being told. And he wouldn't be alone there. There's more than him think that. Mm. But when you start adding false information um, into these stories, that, you know, that's highly, highly problematic. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was called, it's nicknamed Red Radio for a reason. It does have an inherent uh, centre-left bias, doesn't it, Radio New Zealand? <laughs> Well, I know, I, I disagree with you on that. I mean, I, I hear this all the time. Yeah. You, you know, it, let, let's look at Morning Report. You know, if we went back, that show had Mike Hosking, it had Jeff Robinson, it had you, it had yeah. Kim Hill, it had Guy and Espina. Yeah. I wouldn't say any of no, those No, but I can remember, them. for example, the great GE election, having a coffee with then political editor Al Morrison, who told me I had to start going easy on the government or in his words, we were going to lose the election. Um, and that was just perfectly acceptable for him to say, um, I told him that it wasn't and he could pay for the coffee. But I'm sorry, the internal self-censorship and, and cultural bias of Radio New Zealand, having worked there literally for 14 years, Mark, it, it's absolutely palpable. And I would actually say that in this instance, Megan Whelan, who is the digital editor and boss of my call, I've complained about at least half a dozen times in the past 12 years for running social media campaigns using Radio New Zealand's Facebook page personally against me. And Paul Thompson has uh, considered or taken my calls and treated me with contempt. So in many ways, I think uh, they can't say. And we look too, there were complaints about this guy last year and nothing was done. They seem to have been arrogantly ignored any suggestion that they're not pure as the driven snow and the font of all knowledge. Yes, that is surprising, isn't it, that um, the Ukrainian community drew this to their attention. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's where Paul does need to take a serious look at, mm. at how that complaint was treated and whether this guy wasn't put under more oversight at that point. Yeah. Um, but, look, I think the whole idea of um, news organisations being highly political is a bit overblown. Um, you know, I don't even know what left or right is these days, yeah. frankly. <laughs> well, I don't have the advantages of a political science degree either, Mark, but if it walks like a duck and, and talks like a duck, it is probably a duck. Look, as I've got you here, I do want to ask you, how is an outfit like Newsroom finding the new environment? And particularly since the Public Interest Journalism Fund is gone, um, it's over. Um, and, and you and I know it didn't keep businesses running. It was a, a, almost a kind of, you know, to keep them limping along during times of COVID. How are you finding the new media environment? And do you think you guys have been successful? I know it hasn't been easy, but newsroom is still there. It's small 
and it's well more independent than a lot of other news organisations. Um, yeah, for a couple of points there. Um, there's been a lot of disinformation around the Public Interest Journalism Fund, um, you know, from people like you as, as No, no, as Mark, well. what happened was, and I just want to clarify this, the government said, and the people running that fund said it came with no strings attached, and it didn't. There were clearly strings attached. There were government and official documents that when you took that money, prescribed how you had to run your organisation. There is no doubt about that. And the public was gaslit and told there were no strings attached. And there were, Mark, because you signed those documents. You signed and said you'd run a business in accordance with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi to take that money, didn't you? Yeah, well, the, you, we didn't you, have just, any just, Can we just answer that question? Did you or did yeah, you yeah, not so sign contracts? You did. Yeah. I will answer. And the answer is yes, but we were already doing that. Um, so it didn't um, impact us at all, Sean. No, it wasn't whether um, it impacted or not. It's whether or not you had to pay a price and there were strings attached well, to getting no, money from the didn't. government. Now, I don't run my business in accordance with the Treaty of Waitangi because there is no legal obligation for me to do so. In fact, there's no legal obligation before you signed that contract for you to do so because you're not a partner no. and you're not a signatory to the Treaty of Waitangi. No, there's no obligation. You're dead right. But we were already doing that and and do do it and and do, if if you like, believe in the treaty, but... The, Why? Well, don't, you know, should, as a journalist, shouldn't you just believe in the truth? Because <laughs> you're well, now displaying what is inherently a bias on a contestable issue. No, oh, well... I believe the treaty exists and I believe it's a great debate to have, but I don't come down on one... And my organisation doesn't come down on one side of that debate or the other, and we certainly well, won't sign a document for money that says we will, which is what you've done. Well, yeah, fine, good on you. That's 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 your call. But I'd like to just say, you know, this this idea that somehow um, we were forced into doing stories that we didn't want to do is just rubbish. And secondly, the money you get from that fund mm. is there, there isn't an ounce of profit in it. Um, and and where we used it highly valuably, in my view, mm. is to cover regional New Zealand. Because yeah. regional New Zealand has not been covered in it, economically not feasible. Yeah. So um, when this fund expires, you'll see a big, um, you know, desert again in uh, in regional New Zealand, a news desert. Yeah. Which in a strange way I think brings us full circle to Radio New Zealand. And I think in its purest concept, the idea of Radio New Zealand is that in a country this small, a publicly funded broadcaster, or in these days, in the year 2023, media organisation that uses what technology, whatever technology is available, is actually a pretty good thing. It's a pretty good thing for the cohesion of a society. And for that mm -hmm. reason, actually, the independence and integrity of Radio New Zealand has to be improved, not just in regards to this scandal, but overall, mm -hmm. doesn't it? We really do need it if there's not the economic argument for a private company to cover regional New Zealand. We, we totally need it, Sean, and, and we need it to be very strong in the regions. I think metropolitan-wise, New Zealand's quite well served um, by media, but it's, it's clear that the re news coverage in the regions is not what it was and not what it should be. And um, so New Ze Radio New Zealand has an important role uh, to play in that. I'd be happy I to do it. I just need a couple of hundred thousand more people to give me three bucks a week for the platform and we're away laughing. Yep. Um, you know. But that also is the problem, isn't it? Um, yeah. There's not enough people giving the $3. Um, oh, well, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't um, been at it as long as you have, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, look, we, you know, we've been going seven years now, so we're, you know, we're not a startup. Um, yeah. But, you know, the biggest issue for us is, I think, will be the economy this year. Mm. Um, we're highly viable in, when the New Zealand economy is, you know, motoring along okay. Mm. When it tightens up, it becomes a bit more problematic. Um, mm. So, but that's the same for yeah, all Well, I'm crazy. I set this up during COVID and now we're sort of in our, after our, celebrate our fifth. Um, our first anniversary as we go into recession. Uh, brilliant timing on, on my part, uh, Mark. It really, really is. 
Hey, in terms of this review, do you think, and they're increasing calls... I know Winston's jumped on this bandwagon too for some sort of independent review um, into Radio New Zealand. Who do you think could possibly do that apart from you and I? Yeah, I think that is a, um, a, a really good point. I, I think it does need an independent review. Yeah. Um, but I think, yes, it won't be easy to find um, highly respected journalists who are truly independent in this case. Yeah. Um, but... They will be there and uh, they do need to be brought in and they do need to take a good uh, look at it because I think that's the only way back in terms of public trust um, now. All right, but you're the, still going to be publishing their stuff or are you going to send them uh, a yes. note saying we're, we're disappointed in you, you've let yourself down? I, I think I think they're very disappointed in themselves, Sean. I don't think they yeah. need me. And I've got to say, uh, Ben and I went to the press conference on Monday. Jane Patterson was harder into this story on RNZ questioning the Prime Minister than anyone else. And they are pretty good at beating themselves over the back with yep. a birch stick, Radio New Zealand, when it comes to purity. Um, just yeah, they a, are. Just a pity they're not more self-aware. Hey, Mark, really nice talking to you. Thank you for those perspectives. And my texts tell me a lot of people have found it a very interesting conversation. Uh, good luck with it. Oh, we'll, cool. ca we'll catch up soon. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean. Cheers, mate. That is uh, Mark yes. Jennings. He is the boss, one of the founders of um, Newsroom. Uh, and there's Newsroom Pro, and then they do mainly good stuff. They've got a couple of whack job writers. Uh, Mark Dalda, who I constantly give a hard time, but at least Mark Dalda says, I'm a wokey. I'm a wokey who wears a mask to the Prime Ministerial Press Conference. At least he's open about being a snowflake, isn't he? At Radio New Zealand, they, you just have this guy, Mike Hall, sitting there. Oh, I'll just change that. I'll just change that. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, Mark, but I wasn't going to let you get away with saying, oh, the Public Journalist Fund, it didn't come with strings. It did, and you admitted it did, and you signed a contract. But that's all right, because you've already been woke about the treaty anyway.